Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Robert Stickle. I'm also joined by my colleagues Jim Patterson and Paul Estabrooks. Jim and Paul will be today's presenters and will discuss the topic of Power to Choose Adaptive Project Portfolio Management with OnePlan. This webinar is a new addition to the Adaptive Project and Portfolio Management videos we have available on YouTube and also our website. So if you enjoy this webinar, we welcome you to watch the other videos we have available there. And as always, I hope that today's presentation grants you some insight into the world of project and portfolio management and gets you excited for the new developments happening within the industry and here at OnePlan. Thank you again. I'll now turn the presentation over to Jim. Thanks, Robert. Welcome, everybody. Um, happy to have you join us here on this uh, topic that seems to be prevalent in the marketplace today as we talk to customers and prospects uh, on a daily basis this whole power to choose an adaptive project and portfolio management. So let's get started. What's driving this whole concept is the age of digital transformation. As people are transforming and changing and modifying the way they do work, um, it's really bringing the need for different methods and ways of doing work. And this digital transformation is really providing a lot of urgency on this. You know, the inevitable impact is that if you don't uh, adopt this kind of digital wave, uh, you can quickly become a dinosaur. Um, look at some of the examples here of how industries have transformed, like the way we buy things from department stores to online, the way we consume video, the way we you know, call up and, and secure transportation, uh, even things with our vehicles that we buy. But when we go through these digital transformations in our organization, it really affects all parts of the organization and all levels. It affects the executives who have to strategize and come up with new ways and business models to reach our customers and to monetize those things. And the PMOs have um, much more digital projects in their portfolio that they have to manage, probably more than they ever had before if they were a traditional brick and mortar company. And then obviously there's a lot more software development that has to happen and then services to deploy these things and support the customers as we go on through. So there is a ripple effect throughout organizations. So not, no one's immune really in, in companies uh, with this digital age. And on top of that, things are just getting faster. The speed of change and the responding to change and adapting continues to accelerate. We can't get comfortable. You know, market windows for products are shrinking and, uh, Things are changing uh, the way customers want things. And to remain competitive, we have to keep up with that pace or maybe even exceed that pace to be leaders in our, in our domains. So consequently, people are trying to get more agile. Uh, this is often called a shift to the left from more of the longer range, you know, deliver big bang projects at the end of a long development cycle, um, delivering more incrementally and more quickly in that shift left model, you know, more iteratively as we go through or sometimes even continuous delivery models. And the idea is that organizations are really moving here to try and get more um, adaptive and more agile uh, with their um, ways to deliver. On top of that, as we're trying to get more agile, individuals or different parts of organizations are looking for tools that are more conducive to using agile approaches potentially. And it may not be the same across the organization. Here's a chart from just a customer of ours, where if you look down the left-hand side in the different disciplines, and then the different parts of the organization across the top of the, mat of, of, of the matrix, that axis, look at the different tool sets that could potentially be used. This is just one example. It generates silos of information. It uh, promotes maybe different methods of doing things. It makes it hard to bring this all together from a portfolio management perspective. Uh, across an organization. And even different methodologies are being used. You know, Agile is growing fast because of this digital trend, but waterfall is still widely used because there's certain types of projects that maybe lend itself more and maybe always will to that type of approach. And then there's the Agile variants or the hybrid between Agile and waterfall, or even people using cherry picked versions of any one of these for the ones that they think that apply to them. And so the idea here is there's different ways that could be uh, approaches and methods that can be used across the organization in different pockets or different functional areas. Now, that's not bad. The Project Management Institute, uh, uh, in a paper of theirs, said that a blend of approaches is fine, that smart organizations realize that using agile techniques such as Scrum or DevOps is not the only or even the best indicator of an organization's speed or flexibility, that you can make these things work, and it might even be preferable to use the right 
approach for depending on the type of project or the part of the organization that you're in. The key is bringing these things together. So where are you in the agile transformation spectrum, you should ask yourself. You know, if this shift to the left, if we think about the right-hand side in this diagram where a project and portfolio management represents the more traditional waterfall governance-driven uh, type of approaches that are there, um, that is evolving. And as people are trying to become more agile, some may strive to get all the way over to the left-hand side of this, of this diagram and get fully agile. But to do so will probably require a journey that may take years to get there. And in that transformation journey or in that period where some organizations, as the analysts are finding, may remain permanently in what they call an adaptive portfolio management state where they're using both agile and waterfall types of approaches. And there will always be a combination of those approaches and project types that you have in here. Either way, you know, this adaptive portfolio management approach is going to touch everybody as they make that journey to full agile or as they remain in an adaptive mode uh, perpetually. And one plan is here to provide uh, capabilities regardless of which node you're on in this spectrum. So the Gardner Group says that, you know, adaptive project management and reporting process flow. And if you look at this process flow up top, it doesn't look too dissimilar from what you'd have with a more traditional project and portfolio management approach. But it would incorporate the use of multiple execution tools, varying needs in different parts of the enterprise, diversified execution methods or uh, frameworks, and even possibly support continuous delivery models. And the goals here are to reduce your overall project durations, promote continuous customer responsiveness, meaning deliver, get feedback, deliver, get feedback, so that you make sure you're delivering the right things for the customer over time, and also adapt to changing customer needs, which in this marketplace is happening much more frequently. So it's, uh, you know, it's providing for a, a model that allows for execution approaches based on time to value and getting value in the hands of the customer more often and more frequently. Now, in the portfolio management realm, you know, delivering these things in a portfolio isn't isolated to specific projects. You know, these execution efforts, projects, initiatives, et cetera, roll up to your PMOs and to your uh, executives as far as strategy execution and, and strategic portfolio management such that you want to be able to align these things with the right things that you're doing so that the projects and things that you're working on are in alignment with where the organization wants to go and supports the achievement and success of those strategies and outcomes that are being looked for. So to do that, one plan is really trying to address a scenario whereby you may have different tools at the lower level that you're using for different execution of projects. And the methodologies incorporated in those may be, some may be iterative, some may be waterfall, some may be a combination of those. But leadership still wants to see a roll up or a comprehensive view of how all those investments that they're making are tracking. And you may roll those up into, you know, programs or corporate goals or different portfolios or different strategic themes, for example. And that's variable how you would like that to summarize and how you'd like that to roll up through the organization. But the teams may want to remain agile or waterfall in what they're doing, but leadership still needs to see what leadership needs to see to get their finger on the pulse of how uh, the business is performing and how the investments are tracking. Now, even if you go all the way to the left and get full agile across your portfolio, the same challenges exist. You still gotta get that rolled up into a comprehensive view and use a nomenclature that might be different than what's happening at the team level. So for example, at a team level doing agile, they may be looking at things from a burn up and burn down and velocity chart perspective. Uh, where leadership is thinking in terms of the, la uh, the language of the business, which might be more financial, might be more deliverable oriented or milestone oriented. And the idea is to be able to provide that and translate that information to get leadership what they need, but have the teams remain agile is something that uh, one plan helps enable. So project management trends, survey done uh, in not too long ago from the Gartner Group says that EPMOs are embracing the proliferation of multiple project and work management tools across the enterprise, and they're integrating these tools as needed. And that's what we're gonna be showing you today. Another key piece is that PMOs are rejecting traditional project management methods and tools and adopting adaptive project management and reporting tools. 
So this is supported by what's the findings of these uh, analysts that are out there in saying that this is the future and where things are going. Now, the price of not embracing these adaptive approaches and maybe tools that support that can be time wasters if you don't. For example, those silos of information by the proliferation of tools really breed a lot of manual data crunching, which I call data gymnastics across multiple tools and data sources and try to combine them into a common uh, uh, data source and then have to manipulate that into pictures or views that are the digestible decision support information. So the manual report creation for more formatting and updating is a very, let's just say, low value approach to what time could be spent doing other things within the organization. Also, it also promotes uh, duplication of entry and data re-entry across any tool sets or in reporting purposes, not only time consuming, but is also prone to errors. Also chasing team members down for status and updates across multiple and many tool sets is a very difficult thing to do and comprehensively sometimes hard to close the loop on. And the packaging and distribution of reports to different stakeholders and organizational levels becomes part of that whole manual gymnastics. Not to mention trying to track the completeness and timeliness of submissions. Do we have the most recent data as we're reporting on that or do we not? So one plan is designed to, designed to mitigate all that, provide you connection from the strategic level all the way down to execution. And in this particular picture, we're depicting a portfolio which has feeds from a variety of Microsoft tools like Microsoft's project from the web or their traditional project professional desktop tool or Azure DevOps, or it could be JIRA, et cetera. The idea is to be able to accommodate these varying tool sets all feeding into a common portfolio. And the capabilities that one plan brings to the table is very flexible portfolio management capabilities, whether it be traditional portfolio views and central visibility across all those projects, maybe more agile or Kanban board types of views of the portfolio, and even roadmap views that are basically dynamically created based upon the current data sets that are coming in from all these tools. We also provide resource capacity planning and a consistent method across all the projects, regardless of the execution tool being used, as well as financial planning and tracking. Now, these also feed into the portfolio plan for what if analysis and looking at alternatives and scenario planning that factor in the resource constraints and the financial constraints. On the execution level, one plan does have its own tools for both waterfall planning and for agile and sprint planning. But the ability to use our connectors to feed into that and bring that data in from those other tool sets is a very powerful uh, capability and a, and, a, and a key reason why people come to one plan. It also provides consistent uh, method for doing status reporting. We're going to have a webinar on this next week and just getting feedback from your team members, the, the resources that are assigned work in one place, whether it's a my work area or a timesheet or a place in a homepage that brings your attention to the things that are specifically targeted for you and that need your attention, provides the ability to capture uh, that status we talked about comprehensively in a single place without people having to go into four or five, six different tools to do it. And if you think about the power of choice, Let's think about demand. Let's think about the requests and the different sources where these projects initiate from, come from many sources. There might be initial ideas or formal project requests or in a services organization, it might be opportunities that come in from a CRM system. The idea is to get them all into a common funnel for demand so that we can select the work and have an approval and governance process in place that's consistent. One plan does have that common forum, once again, where it all comes together, even if you do it directly in one plan or you bring some of that demand in from different sources. And then even have analytics around that so we can actually analyze and prioritize what are the things we should be working on or could be working on given our current workloads and finances and strategies and priorities. And these connectors that I'm talking about, they're not one-off custom connectors. These are productized connectors that we offer as part of the one plan platform you know the software development tools like azure devops and jira connections to financial or erp systems you know service management tools like service now or dynamics or salesforce uh, professional services feeds in from crm systems like salesforce or dynamics and, and other ideation tools for example these are things that can be 
uh, uh, incorporated into your core one plan implementation. The other part of this is we are built for the Microsoft Cloud. We leverage your authentication and Active Directory for Microsoft and our Office 365. Now, one plan is designed to easily be used directly in your most, you know, your favorite browser, but it also is designed so that it can be uh, accessed and consumed with a fused user experience. If you're working in Power Apps today, you can access one plan in a Power Apps environment. You can use one plan within Teams. We're, uh, we're an authorized Microsoft Teams application such that it can be used in the context of the collaborative uh, environment of Teams. You can use it right within Azure DevOps. So if we're connected to Azure DevOps for data, we can also use it while we're in Azure DevOps. And the same holds true for Dynamics and SharePoint as well. The key is to keep people working and staying in the tools that they work in every day and do not have to do task shifting or tool shifting as often as they do today. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Paul Estabrooks, who will give us a demonstration of these things in action and show you that these capabilities are here today for you to leverage. Perfect. And I'm, I'm gonna start a little bit at where, where some of what Jim started with, which is around ideation. So you can see here, I have a list of ideas. Some are in review, some are actually closed. There's a few new ones in here. And I, I could go in and add a new idea uh, and fill out a form if I jump into one that doesn't matter the stage. There's some data in here that you could capture. It's got a governance process as well. So I could capture that intake, but as Jim mentioned, intake itself has many tools of choice, if you will. And so through the integration capabilities that we have, we could tie into a list in SharePoint, a team site, a power app in Teams with some great functionality that Microsoft provides there. Uh, we've seen clients use tools like Salesforce or Microsoft CRM or ServiceNow or other tools like that to capture their intake, or they may use a combination of those and bring those in. What we're looking for obviously would be some common information that we can then vet and review and, and analyze and then ultimately promote to become an initiative that we're going to then build out a more complete business case on. So I wanted to start here sort of as a simple repository for ideation because it in and of itself, as Jim mentioned, is a tool of choice. Then I'm going to dive into the portfolio and this is kind of where I want to spend the majority of our time. Here we go. So I'm in the portfolio here and I'm just going to expand this. We have some program or portfolios. Those are programs and underneath that. We have a combination of projects and epics. So we're, in here, we are catering to both a, a traditional waterfall approach to, to, to execution as well as an agile approach using, using epics. But underneath that and within that, there may also be a variety of, of call them sub approaches or, or sort of approaches within an approach. And that is, I may have projects in here that are following a tool like uh, Jira, so they're they're an agile tool, or they're following uh, something else, like they're using Microsoft Planner, there it is right there. So they're using a lightweight scheduling tool. What we're trying to provide is a sense of, a, of, of how a community functions, and, and we all live in communities, and those communities have, have laws, there's sort of guardrails around what we must do, but within that comes a, a level of freedom of how we want to conduct ourselves or operate. And we see a similar paradigm here, how each project team chooses to organize or how the leader of that project chooses to track the work can vary, but, but being a part of the PMO, a part of that community, there are certain standards or things that we must adhere to. And the goal here is to sort of provide both of that to, to each team. Execute the project how you need to, but we need some certain information. So we may have projects in here that are very robust in their configuration, right? They're using a tool uh, like Project Professional itself, and they've got baselines and you know cost uh, resources and and uh, all kinds of rich data, and they're tracking all of that. We may have a project here that is a combination of Project Pro and DevOps, so it's a hybrid within a hybrid environment. We may have one like I pointed to, which is which is straight planner, which is more lightweight and using cards and sort of boards and that type of approach. We may have these agile ones where they're using DevOps or potentially Jira. Uh, we may have a project in here that's using our work planner, but is actually just using it as a Kanban board. All of those are possible paradigms. All of those are things we see in every client's environment today. But what we want people to be able to do, and I'm going to pick on the planner project first, is be able to provide so there's that data that would have come in from intake, okay? 
we may provide some more. So we can still create a business case, regardless of what tool we're ultimately going to use. We can still provide the data needed to do a business case. We could do a high-level budget, you know, some narrative here and things like that. But what we want people to do as part of this community is then be able to say, well, what resources do you think you need and when do you need them? So this project, it's up against some other resource constraints with all the red, but this project needs those resources, that many hours is the expectation of what they're going to need. Again, that's not data you could actually track in plan or the way it's constructed here, but one plan's providing that sort of that ability to abstract ourselves from from how the tool of choice functions to be able to provide a common set of information. So here I know what my resources are. And from there, I can start to build out, this isn't a complete budget, but I pulled in the resource costs so I could start to see what the cost of this project might be, what's its budget. And I may, you know, go in here and fill out that, you know, there's a, I don't know, that'd be a big project, but there's some other money in here that I need to track as well. So that's my budget for this particular project. So I've gathered that information, yet I'm actually doing this using a planner, using a connection to planner, okay? So I've pulled in some simple tasks that are coming in from planner. And ultimately, while I'm here, I could then go and do a status report. I could provide some, some information back to management on how this project that I've chosen to execute in planner is proceeding. It is progressing, and where am I in issue, or do I have some risks related to health and schedule uh, where I am on other items so that they have that line of sight? So that was a planner project. I could come down here to one that's in both DevOps and in uh, Project Pro and to do a similar thing. Here, I've also got resources committed to the project. Let's pull that over quickly. Right? I'm using the exact same frame, more resources, but the exact same lens, and I have a budget that I am tracking to, and I can track costs and actuals and so forth. I have my work plans, and I can go do a status report, same sort of frame. So whether I do that in Agile, or I do that in Planner, or I'm using a rich tool like Project Pro or Project for the Web, I can still provide that common information about my resourcing needs, my budget, track those items, as well as provide status. And so by doing that, here's all my projects. Here, they're all members of a community. They're providing consistent information. Underneath that, they're executing as they need to. And so if I come up here and I go to project prioritization, what I really want to be able to do is harness that information is be able to say, well, where are we? So if I prioritize my projects, I'll prioritize them this way. There they are, stack rank based on how they scored during uh, a scoring mechanism that would have either been done at the business case end or the intake level, depends on how you want to configure it. So again, independent of the tool that we ended up executing with, we still were able to score them and come up with an understanding of their strategic value. And if we wanted to move projects up and down, take that one that we were just playing with and say, that's a much more important project, I'm gonna put it in second. Okay, let that save quickly. So now I've modified my model just that quickly to say that it's our number two project that we're gonna do. And there's that planner one with its budget, right? And now I wanna be able to sort of figure out from a financial perspective, how is this gonna look? So I have my target in here of just over 5 million and I've got $7.7 .7 million. So now I could start to make decisions. That project I just moved up, I probably wanna keep in. You know, Maybe I take the planner one out. Maybe through our prior prioritization, we take it out, we knock some money out of our equation and on down I could go. I'm not gonna try and balance this. I'll just show you sort of the capability. If it's proposed, we don't have enough money, we maybe should take it out too. Each time you see it's, it's looking at what, what's the new sort of budget picture. And I could start to move projects in and out and try and get them out of these months that are red because there is actually budget available later in the year. So, you know, I could, I could maybe move a project out some and see if that helps my math a little bit, okay? Just to quickly try and fix what I'm doing. Again, I'm not gonna try and balance this here. But because we were able to capture that budget need for each project, we, weren't, we didn't have to create a detailed schedule and, and cost it up by adding costs or, and so forth to each task or try and figure out how we're gonna do that. We didn't have some budgets in spreadsheets and some in buried in schedules. They were all in a common frame that we were able to pull together very quickly and analyze. 
Likewise, if I go and look at this from a resourcing perspective, there's a reason why we did that. Now you can see where our over allocation is, and, and we still have some of those projects out, but now our problem is in money, it's people, and how would we move this around or potentially hire in order to fulfill on these requirements if we kind of get, our down, get down to the budget we're targeting. And we know this because we filled that form out or that, that table for each project. Again, I didn't need to, I was not bound to, the, the constraints of the different scheduling tools and how they treat resources and the timing of resources. Some will look at resourcing time phase and it's work versus effort and versus duration and others, it simply assumes a, a full-time commitment. Others don't do that at all. They don't time phase the data. So how on earth would you get to here? Well, that's what one plan provides. It provides us this ability to, to profile the resourcing requirement independent of how we're gonna schedule it. And then we'll approve resources. Then we will, as a team, deploy them against the tasks, however we're organizing them uh, to execute on the project. But we're abstracted from that in doing this. So I will close on, on a few uh, dashboards that bring this sort of to life. Load up some data. We could start. We could start. I know uh, Jim showed this. You know the idea of ideation and understanding, regardless of where those where they came from. What do they look like? How do they how do they sort of prioritize? How do they how do they show up? And then I can jump over and look at my portfolio. And I can start to drill into this portfolio. I could start to look at it if I just click on one of these. I'm going to go uh, drill through to portfolio details and have a look at this particular portfolio and I can go into this further and further and look at my financials, my status, my other information. And I'm aggregating, in this case financials, I'm aggregating budgets, potentially actuals as well, uh, to look at how each of the projects in that portfolio are performing. And remember, underneath that, in that portfolio, were projects following multiple different methodologies using multiple different tools. But at this level, where I want to look at it in terms of spend, I have clarity, I have a completeness of that picture. I have the status information that I need as well from all of those because they're all participating in that community and providing that consistent information, but yet we give them the freedom to use the tools that they want. And Jim, with that, I think we've covered what we wanted to cover today. Terrific. Well, thanks for that demonstration, Paul. Let's, uh, let's summarize and talk about some potential next steps you can take. So, in this realm of adaptive project and portfolio management, uh, the ability to have one or more portfolios, one or more execution tools, um, one or more methodologies or frameworks that you use to execute, bringing that stuff all together has a lot of power to bring a consistency to that and avoid a lot of manual effort like we talked about. So the value of adaptive PPM, just to recap, ensures that organizations are working on the right things aligned to priorities, it provides centralized visibility, allowing for rapid response to changing conditions because you got a better finger on the pulse. Uh, it keeps users working in their preferred tools and solutions that are appropriate for their role, maturity, and the type of work that they have. It also supports a variety of execution methodologies and tools, improves adoption by minimizing duplication of effort and unnecessary complexity. Um, it also provides a modern user experience, and that generally drives better participation and compliance. It integrates all work and resources into a common hub, as Paul showed you, and the teams continue to be agile as they need to be, but leadership still gets the visibility and the metrics that they require. Overall, this promotes better collaboration and decision support across all areas of the business. Now, we have a passion for this discipline. Um, you know, One Plan Solutions is a multi-gold certified Microsoft partner, but our passions in project portfolio management uh, we were named multiple times and even last year as their global project and portfolio management partner of the year uh, and actually a finalist in their Power Apps and Power Automate, which we support and help uh, implement as well. Uh, we're also recognized by the analysts like Gartner and Infotech Research and certified by Scaled Agile Inc. for people that want more of those agile portfolio capabilities built into the solutions that we put in. So the idea is that we do this as on a routine basis. We're not a general systems integrator. And we're here to help you to whatever degree you'd like. We can just stand up technology for you, uh, but we really are passionate about helping people in the process and the people side of things to make sure that the adoption and the, uh, let's just say the outcomes and the benefits received are optimized within an organization. So we're here to help you to the degree you wanna be helped. 
We do these webinars all the time. Just a little preview. Uh, this time next week, we have a webinar called Capturing Consistent Status Information in a Hybrid PPM Environment. More focused about you know, getting that reporting and status reporting consistent, not have to manually generate, recreate these, almost as a project in and of itself every reporting period. How, how we can help you make your life easier in those areas. Um, if you like what you saw here today and you want to try it out, uh, go up to AppSource, uh, Microsoft's AppSource, and we have a number uh, of, let's just say, templates of how to use one plan up there. We showed you the Adaptive Project Portfolio Management one today, which is the more fully functional one. So that's there as well, or if you want more one more that's more structured around Agile purely, or just the strategic portfolio management stuff, there's different templates up there you can choose from. But to do what you saw today, the Adaptive Portfolio Management template is the one you want to use. As well as, if you're interested in just thinking to yourself, you know, how do I get from where I'm at into a tool set like this? Take us up and engage us on a pre-roadmap workshop. You know, we'll help review what you're currently doing, uh, assess those current requirements that you have and the desired future state you have, and determine what's the best way or route to implement or migrate into the solution and what that roadmap might look like or what the investment might be. Uh, given that we're a Microsoft tool, um, um, let's just say uh, built for the Microsoft Cloud, I should say, uh, you may already own a bunch of the components that may fit into this solution, so it may only be an incremental investment for you. And so we can help uh, you with free trials, and we're happy to chaperone you and support you through that trial to make sure you get the most out of that, the roadmap workshop like I talked about. And outside of the quick, you know, generalized demo that Paul gives you on a webinar, if you have more specific needs you'd like to address, we're happy to schedule a personalized one-on-one -on -one demo tailored more to your use cases and your requirements. Just reach out to us at contact at oneplan.ai or look for more information at www.oneplan.ai. And with that, I'd just like to thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to join us on this. You know, you can reach out and contact us generally at that contact at, uh, email, or you can reach out to Paul or I individually if you care to. Uh, we'd really love to engage with you. Um, you know, as a company, uh, our motto is that we're invested in success, and by that we mean in your success, and we'd really like to engage with you and see how we can help you the way we've helped others. So with that, uh, we want to provide you with one interface, with one experience, all bringing together in one plan. Have a great day, and thanks for, thanks for joining us today.